Thanks, Doug. Hey, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, we're excited to be here. My name is Brian and I work for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, and I'll be joined by a couple of the great folks as well. But first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you registered for this event, we really appreciate the support. Or if you're just in the general public hanging on the back, you get a little extra education for the night. So, uh, but thank you all for joining us for our uh, annual installment of the 2024 Waterwatch Lecture Series. Um, we're really excited to be here and to be here at Island Creek Oysters. Uh, thank you so much for having us. So before we begin, um, if you are not familiar with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, we are just a small little local nonprofit conservation organization. Our office is in Norwell, but we work all throughout the South Shore from Hall all the way down to Kingston. And uh, we are a membership organization. We do lots of education, engagement uh, activities. And so if you're not a member, there's a few folks here who can help you uh, figure out how to become a member and help support what we do. Um, we also do lots of partnerships, uh, tonight being one of them. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So um, before we begin, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Clean Harbors, uh, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, and Rockland for all supporting, once again, supporting this annual event. Um, and so I know probably most of you here, if you register for this event, you already know about this is an eight part series. Uh, there will be one next week, but the next few will be on Zoom. And then the last one will be at Stellwagen uh, Brewery down in Marshfield uh, in March. So uh, we have flyers if you're not familiar with the rest of the series. So uh, with that said, I would like to pass it over to, uh, to Chris Sherman with uh, Island Creek uh, to maybe say a couple things uh, about Island Creek here. And uh, uh, and once again, thanks for, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. Nah. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, really excited to be hosting tonight. Um, I'm Chris Sherman. I'm CEO of Island Creek. Uh, Skip Bennett, Island Creek founder and owner, is there over in the corner. And uh, we couldn't be more excited to host this group uh, at this venue. I think when we... Uh, acquired this campus and kind of started working on making it all come together, making it work for us and for the community. This is precisely the type of thing we imagined happening here. Uh, so it's an exciting moment for us to kind of see it to fruition. And we're really thankful to uh, North South River Watershed Association and to Steve from the Nature Conservancy for kind of making it come together. And of course, to all of you for, for coming out and uh, seeing what there is to see. Uh, one thing I'll say really quick is just that uh, at Island Creek, one of the things that gets a lot of us out of bed in the morning to come to work is the positive environmental community impact that growing shellfish has on Duxbury Bay. A lot of us, myself included, our Duxbury natives grew up as water rats in various forms being out on Duxbury Bay, and it's incredibly important to us. So uh, that starts... Uh, you know, in the upland and works its way down and there's a whole kind of system that has to come together to ensure that the bay and the environment that it relies on is healthy enough for our business to thrive. So not only is it a passion project for us, it's a major kind of piece of our, our long-term strategy for Island Creek. So whenever we're able, we kind of help to support this work in whatever way we can. Um, you'll probably hear from Steve, the work that we've done collaboratively with the Nature Conservancy over the years. And I think, you know, I can remember starting shucking at raw bars for uh, the NSRWA back, you know, 15 years ago. So uh, two great organizations and I'm psyched to have them. And thank you once again for coming out. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Chris. This, this is obviously a fantastic venue. We're, we're easily happy to be here. Um, so, like I said, we partner with a lot of organizations, and one of our marquee partnerships for this program for I think the past 30 years plus. Plus, I bet you there's people in this room that might be able to tell us more accurately that number. I'm looking at. <laughs> So yeah, it had to be at least 30, 30 years. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're so excited. So my name is Doug Lowry. I work for Mass Audubon. I'm their senior teacher naturalist for the Southeast region. And uh, excited to be, once again, partnering with the watershed with this event. It's amazing. And you all know, I'd love to, to, to push the Watershed Association. Uh, I feel strongly about their mission, sat on the board for a little bit, and I was president until they kicked me out. Uh, and one of the things that 
I'm amazed about this organization. It's, it's humble beginnings. And it was kind of known as the little engine that could. And I like to think that it's the little engine that did it. It's just amazing what they have done with the staff they have. They've built this very reputable organization that other watersheds look to as a mentor. And if you look at our North and South River, just imagine what it they look like if the watershed didn't exist. The watershed Association didn't exist. So thank you for your support both for both organizations and, and also for attending this program. And Brian and I are excited to, tomorrow will be the first uh, of a return program. Uh, it's called uh, Birding Through Changing Climate. And so both organizations will have open registration. Uh, you can sign up with the watershed or sign up with us. And every third Thursday of the month, we'll use the North River office as our jumping off point, And we'll go off for three hours of birding in somewhere in the water. So if you'd like to join us, we'd love to see you. Uh, and, and again, thanks so much for being here. So thanks to Brian. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, they, yeah, those birding trips, the transportation is provided too with, with uh, Mac Audubon Van and the NSR to be a brand new van <laughs> this year. So um, it's interesting you mentioned, Doug, about being a mentor. You were certainly a mentor for me when I got started here, but professional outdoor guy taking me out on the rivers uh, early then same with you too, Mark. So, uh, so once again, I definitely uh, look up to you as, uh, as a mentor for me. So, all right. Um, so, I would like to introduce um, a great guest. We have a special person here today, Steve Kirk with the Nature Conservancy. He is the Coastal Program Director with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and uh, we're really excited to have him here. We talked a little bit about what he does. And uh, will be our, our um, question for you. So, that's fresh. Thank you. Thank you. We did not. Uh, we didn't, um, anyway, you know, education and conservation and where, uh, you know, more than to be here. Thanks very much, everybody. I'm Steve Kirk. I'm the Coastal Program Director of the Nature Conservancy in Massachusetts. Thanks for having me for this. Um, what a great way to talk about um, our work. And so really grateful to Sam and the Watershed um, Association. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Island Creek for having us. Chris mentioned we've, we've worked with Island Creek for years on several different efforts, and I'm going to talk about one of them here briefly. Um, I would say that in this space, it's like you guys have done it again. I've, I've been to the campus several times, not in this space. Really great. Um, you can go to the next slide. So, a little bit about first the Nature Conservancy, and before we start talking about Oysters. The Conservancy is an environmental conservation organization. We're in 50 states and uh, up to 80 countries. You know, we're working toward a world where people and nature thrive. And we sort of bend that into the challenges facing the planet and the climate and the biodiversity crises that, that we're facing. And the work of the Nature Conservancy is really, you know, funneled and we're all working toward addressing those challenges. The work that I'm going to talk about tonight, you know, is is one element of that, but you know, the priorities are around again on the climate side, mitigation, how can you take carbon dioxide out of the air? Um, and the adaptation side of things, we need to adapt to the effects of climate change that are already happening, that are already happening. Think about the last you know, weak and the storm activity that's gone on here. Um, you know, protecting rivers that, you know, we're here with the Watershed Association for North and South Rivers, um, oceans and, and land. And so, you know, the work that I'm focused on as the coastal program director is that sort of near shore and right at the shoreline. And a big component of our coastal areas, the area right outside the window here that, you know, are a big part of our culture, our lifestyle, things that we do, um, 
are dependent on on these coastal waters. Just also thinking back, actually, there are some people doing math on like, you know, this many years I've been doing that. I think it was about 13 years ago that I came and I bought some seed from Skip for my oyster farm, which I don't have anymore. But, um, you know, I'm going to talk about some of our habitat restoration work and the aquaculture industry and how we're bringing those together. But to start it off, we're talking about oysters and the value that they provide to uh, our coastal areas. And so you can, you know, I think most people sort of understand when their people place value on like a coral reef, they're hot spots for biodiversity. They can slow wave energy as they're, you know, protecting the, the land that's behind the coral reef. We don't have coral reef here. I mean, except in maybe some of the offshore areas, there are deep sea corals, but here our sort of temperate uh, an analog are oyster reefs. Oysters filter water, they, they improve the water quality, they provide habitat for other marine life. You know, in the right setup, they can slow wave energy and help to, you know, reduce erosion and, and flooding. They're really important to just the basic function of the, of the estuary and our coastal areas. Um, you can go ahead. I said, is that at the bottom well, it's the trouble is that they're mostly gone mm -hmm. there's there's uh you know an academic paper that did a historic look back and we're somewhere on the order of 85 percent of the oyster population globally is has been reduced from its historic extent mm -hmm. that's from over harvest from shellfish disease um from you know what we do on land and you know its impact to coastal waters. So with those oysters gone, also gone with them are all the things that they do, like help to improve the water quality and provide habitat for marine life. So a really simple response that the Nature Conservancy has invested a lot in over time is um, oyster habitat restoration. It's like, it's not there, let's put it back. We don't always decide to put it back exactly where it was because the world is changing and it might not work. So, so really we think about um, rebuilding the habitat and keeping oysters in the water in a place that it needs them or a place that it can thrive and do the good work that oysters do. So um, here in Massachusetts, it's something that we haven't really done a lot of. The Nature Conservancy has done a lot of it, like in the Chesapeake or in the Gulf of Mexico and, and internationally in Australia and Hong Kong. But um, Massachusetts, it's it's not something that's like baked into the character of all of these towns um, and these uh, these watersheds that really would benefit from this activity. We just haven't brought it into the fold. Um, so. We're, we think of the oyster restoration and those habitat creation projects as, as a means to, to bring back the things that we need, that the estuary and, and our coastal areas need. But the scale of the problem is, is so big, from nutrient pollution to you know, other land-based practices that are, that are going on that are challenging the coastal system, we have to sort of look to what else is on the table. So the Nature Conservancy spends a lot of time working on the land side. What I'm talking about is what we do in the water. And so here we can look to the aquaculture industry to, um, to be a provider of much the same things that we're looking for when you rebuild the natural habitat. By having more oysters in the water, you're getting that filtration. You're getting the water quality improvement by having the gear and the different ways that you grow oysters in the farm setting, you're actually providing habitat for marine life. It's like, hey, wait a second, this sounds a lot like what we're, what we're after. Mm -hmm. To say nothing of the, you know, the economic impact, mm -hmm. the, the social impact of growing nutritious food. You can look at agriculture as you know, a driver of much of the environmental problems in the world. Something like 80% of, um, of habitat loss globally from agriculture, 70% of the fresh water used on the planet for agriculture, uh, like a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change come from the ag sector. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Nature Conservancy is working with 
the you know the big agriculture producers, but most of that work is to try to make it less bad. It's like how do you slow the runoff? How do you use less fertilizer? How can you improve your grazing practices? Well, aquaculture and particularly aquaculture with shellfish, we're like flipping the script a little bit. It's a really powerful and simple concept. Like how do you um, maximize the benefits of this food production system instead of how do you make it less bad? Um, it's not to say that like all aquaculture in all places is all good all the time. We're talking about well-sighted, well-run operations that, um, you know, for these these species like shellfish and some seaweeds that um, can provide real environmental benefits. So, you know, the the conservancy's program around aquaculture is is relatively new. In comparison to the organization, which was founded in 1951, we're like a 10 year old program in aquaculture, which is pretty short in the lifespan of the organization. So, you know, and I, I would say before my time with TNC and as a farmer, it's like my farm was teeming with life. <laughs> You'd pull a cage up and there'd be a juvenile lobster in it, fish and crabs be jumping out of the cage. And, you know, many growers will tell you that we're providing this uh, this habitat value. We are these biodiversity hotspots. Um, there's good scientific literature that defends that, but we wanted to sort of plant our flag in the sand and, and we're doing some of this research on our own. So this is a picture from just across the way at, at the Sakewish farm, where we were using underwater video cameras to, um, to observe how different species were using the gear. It's one thing like, you know, don't be fooled. If you throw a Volkswagen or like some broken toilets in the water, there's gonna be fish around it. But if you actually can quantify and look at the different, you know, age of the species that are there and how they're using it, you know, smarter people than I can figure out whether you're attracting fish or if you're producing more fish. If you can get baby fish to make it to being bigger fish, you're actually being a fish producer. And so, you know, along the lines of, you know, the food story, if we're talking about rebuilding fisheries and that sort of thing, you can catch less, but you can also make more. And that's something that we're really interested in highlighting, um, you know, with this work. So it was pretty amazing, actually. I was out with the researchers and we were, um, it was like a really beautiful day. It was like mid tide, so you could walk out with your waders. And there's a osprey circling overhead because there's a stand right nearby. And I was like just standing still for a little while. And you could see these, you know, these juveniles, you know, smallish stripers hanging out under the cages and sort of like holding station there. And you like, you look up at the osprey, you look down at the you're like, you guys hiding out from him or what? You know, like it was, it was a really amazing thing just to see that. I mean, that's like, not the scientific side. That's was just like, wow, this is really cool. Um, you can go ahead. So, um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is really intentionally work with the aquaculture industry to help us build momentum for our restoration work. So the growers, and as as Chris mentioned, you know, the growers are the most natural partner for us here. They are ultimate stewards of the environment. They have to be because their business depends on it. You can't sell shellfish from dirty water. They really care, and and that's like a really good starting place. Um, also, they happen to be really good at growing shellfish and have shoreside infrastructure and the ability to support the type of things that we're really interested in, which is growing more shellfish habitat. So during the pandemic, when restaurants shut down and we weren't hanging out in groups like this, um, the market for oysters was really impacted. TNC was able to um, raise funds and, you know, like in short, buy oysters from the growers and plant them on our restoration sites. And it was sort of like uh, one of those triple win kind of things where we were, you know, supporting businesses that we want to survive and that uh, you know are providing good environmental benefit at the at the minimum 
you know, with all of the other benefits while we're also, you know, feeding our restoration projects. And so this SOAR program, Supporting Oyster Aquaculture and Restoration uh, Project, has been going on for several years and, and we're really interested in trying to like institutionalize it in a way that the that the growers can rely on, you know, guaranteed sale and maybe have a diversity in their revenue stream. Um, and you know, we can start to build some momentum for, for building more habitat. So this was a week ago in the town of Fairhaven where we were, you know, planting some oysters off the side of the skip on one of our restoration uh, projects that we cut a check for the, you know, the farmer that grew those oysters who, you know, some of them weren't, you know, maybe the ideal to sit on the plate for, um, uh, for the raw bar market that you guys are enjoying here. They might not have gotten a effect price say, or, you know, at least during the pandemic, we were getting really large oysters because, you know, your asparagus may grow and die if you don't harvest it, but the oysters in many cases will just continue to grow. Um, and so maybe I'll just leave you with, you know, what, what we're after and, what um, what we're really you know excited to try to build some momentum behind is is sort of the yes and type of approach of trying to get more habitat restoration in the water, supporting the aquaculture industry, and you know your guys' support here of of the watershed association of you know coming out to the raw bar. These are all steps that you're all taking um, to be supportive of that. So we're really grateful. Um, I'll stop there. I think they're, we're trying to build in time for some Q&A and dialogue and that sort of thing. But thanks a lot for Yes, Steve, um, um, I can help facilitate any Q&A if you'd be open for that. So uh, sort of first come, first serve. Anyone have any questions for Steve? That, yeah. Could you explain a little bit how the oysters are used back in water? I mean, what happens to them when you put them back? Yeah, the question was, you know, like, what happens to the oysters when you put them back or how we use them once we put them back? We don't really do much. We put them in the water and they do what they do. We have, like, ongoing scientific monitoring so that we're sure that we do what we're intending to do and we can see if it's working, if they're staying alive, if they're reproducing and you know the, the impacts that they're having. But the last slide where you're dumping the oysters over the side, it's very unceremonious, you know? It's like, off you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's really it. You mentioned how agriculture is sort of Lots of habitat and kind of mess things up. It's like land. How, how is a lot of culture in the ocean? I mean, you measure how people, how can you stop some of those things out? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was trying to caveat pretty heavily that, like, not all aquaculture in all places is the right approach. I think, you know, in our area, in Massachusetts in general, and, you know, really the East Coast of the U.S., we're really struggling with nutrient pollution. Too many nutrients coming from land and going to the coastal water. And there are there are a suite of things that we can use to address that problem. Some of it is like getting real infrastructure pro uh, projects off the ground on land, like sewering. Some of it is you know doing cranberry bottom restoration. This between habitat building for, for oysters and, you know, the agriculture industry, those are tools that are sort of in, in the mix that can help address that particular problem. You know, if you think about the spatial extent, I wish I had the number offhand, like how many acres of coastal watershed do we have? You know, of the, the 14 or so hundred acres of aquaculture and the less than 10 in shellfish restoration, there's a lot more coastal water than those numbers. So I think right now we're probably not in danger of 
mono crop challenging the system? Steve, I'm sorry if I missed it. Do you have a, an estimation of how many gallons uh, oyster, the individual oyster in the filter? It's like a pretty gas per gallon. Yeah, but like the, a number that's thrown around a lot is an oyster can, fi can filter 50 gallons of water in a day. I think that's like in, a, that's like a big oyster in really good condition on its best, you know, sort of like, but, um, you know, you put a, a few million oysters in an area and you get some real filtration value. And so, you know, the water quality element is, it's pretty real. You, you can clarify the water by just pulling some of the solids and sediment out, which allows light in, but also an important piece is um, pulling down some of the excess nutrients like nitrogen. Steve, I've got one from um, uh, the internet land. And thanks again for everyone who's tuned in uh, virtually. We've got about 80 people that are listening in. Um, uh, are you concerned about Holtec's commitment to dumping radioactive water in the Bay? Yeah, it's, I, I have not been tracking that issue closely. I mean, so personally, I think, yeah, it's a little bit concerning. I, I don't think I'm at the ready to address that issue. I don't, I don't know enough about it. I'm thinking, how far off the coast can you farm these start? Yeah, the, the, the question is, how far offshore can you farm these animals? I, I think it's probably a, an issue of economics before it's an issue of where they'll live. Um, you know, oysters are pretty durable animals and they can survive in a wide range of conditions from the salinity and temperature, um, you know, changes. Further you go offshore, you start to get into, you know, open ocean and the, the type of infrastructure that you might need to grow them starts to get bigger. The access is more challenging. Um, you know, so there are different methods. I'd be glad to have some of the growers chime in if you'd like, but you know, you can use gear that's on the bottom to hold the oysters in place. You can have gear that's floating on the surface that holds them in place. Um, so you can do that in a lot of different settings. So it theoretically could be quite deep, but you start to get into bigger challenges. Uh, you had mentioned um, oyster reefs. Um, how long would it take for a community of oysters to actually form a reef? Mm. Yeah, so the question was like, how long does it take for oysters to form a reef? When we're when we're basically building those reefs, we 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 try to establish basically like a base layer. We often will put down like empty and clean shell, and then we'll plant oysters on top of that. And it does not take long for oysters to start to grow together. As they as they grow, and if they're touching another oyster, they'll often grow into clusters. And so it happens very quickly. You know, the world happens around it when there's predation from crabs, and if there's storm activity, you might get things to move around. But the establishment of an of an oyster reef or an oyster bed doesn't take particularly long. The thing that we really often look for is, will oysters continue to grow there on their own? You can kickstart the system by creating it, but one of the things that we look for in siting is trying to find a place where there are already some oysters and they might be um, able to help repopulate that area on its own. I didn't quite understand how the did you determine that one oyster can put 50 gallons of water in that one question. And secondly, what happens to the solids that they take in? That has to be excreted as well. Yeah, so the question was about the statistic around 50 gallons of filtering. I, I didn't come up with that number. It came out of a scientific literature article in a journal. 
which you know studied the filtration rate of oysters. So that's why it gets cited by a lot of people. And what happens with the solids, either uh, the you know the animal will ingest what it takes in, and it will either decide that it's going to be food or it's going to be not food. And the food it will digest, and just like everything, when I was reading the story to my kids, like everything poops, yeah. it will poop. The things that it doesn't eat, it will basically packet it up and then send it out of its body, out of the food shed. Steve, um, that'll kind of pair up with this question. When oysters are filtering water, do they become polluted with heavy metals? Uh, I don't know if oysters will take in and like hold heavy metals. I think that's a reasonable concern and people should be assured that if you're eating an oyster that you buy from a restaurant or a market, that that's not a concern because there are very stringent rules on where you can harvest oysters from and other shellfish from. And those, uh, those rules are meant to keep the public safe and they do a very good job of that. Average time between seed and harvest. The question was uh, how long from seed to harvest? <clears throat> It really depends on the location where you're growing. Some places that are really favorable to oyster growth, um, you know, you can do it in under a year. Uh, in other places, it might be four or five years before you get from seed, which will come out of the hatchery. So Island Creek runs a hatchery here on this campus where they breed oysters and you start with very, very small oyster and it goes out onto the farm. Um, you know, some farmers, and again, it's really dependent on the environmental conditions, whether you can get an oyster up to, you know, a market size on the order of, you know, many months or several years. And was, oh, yeah. Steve, I just want to add that, you know, we often complain about nitrogen as being a dilutant. It's important in the sense that it's a, it's naturally occurring. It's not a thing. I think north of 70 percent of the air will be nitrogen. Um, it becomes a pollutant when they put it on the lawns and um, septic system leaves nitrogen. So it becomes problematic as it migrates into the bay. Um, but we use the term as a pollutant. It's it's very, very, very different than heavy metals. Um, so, you know, the, the state has really strict regulatory um, oversight with where we can grow shellfish. So the water that we're growing shellfish in is really free of what we would really qualify as pollutants. The nitrogen is more detrimental to the environment than to, to people. It's not at all detrimental to people. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Skip. <laughs> We have, I have gotten into the practice of, of saying nutrient pollution to make it sound like a problem because it really is a problem because there are too many nutrients. If you over fertilize your tomato plants, they probably won't do very well. And that's what's happening to our coastal waters. There are too many nutrients that are putting the system out of balance. It's not a pollutant in the way that, so thanks for that. Sam. So um, I have two questions. One is, where in Massachusetts are you guys doing some of your waste reef restoration work? And why can't you do more? <laughs> we've done um we repeat that i don't know if they heard that yeah, yeah so the, the question was about um where we're doing some of our restoration work and uh how can we do more or why aren't we doing more we in massachusetts in massachusetts um we've done some work in the buzzards bay watershed several towns there as well as on the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason we haven't done quite as much, like there are a lot of little factors to that. Massachusetts in some ways is a challenging place to do this because all of the management of coastal water and shellfish in particular 
are uh, happening at the town level. So, you know, an organization like mine, we would love to work at the state, regional, national level to do things at scale so that you can have meaningful impact. Mm -hmm. Where we're, we have to start at the municipality level to get buy-in for a project. Mm -hmm. And I sort of mentioned at the beginning, and some places are really keen to see this kind of work. Some places are not interested. It's not quite like JK out of town with a pitchfork, but it's like, we don't do that here and no, thank you. And that's fine. It's, so that's, that's an element. You know, it's a hugely regulated area. It's a public space. There are a lot of different user groups. How many moorings are in this, you know, Plymouth, Kingston, Duxbury, Harbor complex? How many oyster farms are there? How many private docks are there? You know, there, there are a lot of competing uses for the space and it is a public space. So that's a fact, you know, and then it's, so that, so the, you know, the public use element is one and it's, it's a highly regulated thing. And as it should be, you know, you don't want to be moving shellfish all over the place willy nilly. A lot of challenges have come from doing, moving animals around the world, invasive species and things like that. So we have to be really thoughtful about that. And there are a lot of safeguards in place to make sure that you don't make a mistake, but sometimes they present as obstacles too. Yeah, got one. Um, when farming uh, oysters, do you have to worry about natural predators? And if so, how do you prevent your crop from being eaten? Yeah, so the question was about in a farming setting, um, dealing with natural predators. And the short answer is yes. You know, there are, in a healthy system, there are a lot of different shellfish species, oysters included. And they can basically be lower down the chain in the food chain. And so there are a lot of things that would eat shellfish and oysters, um, not the least of which are humans. And that has been largely their demise, you know, yeah. in the natural setting. But, you know, where my farm was, we had a ton of uh, sea stars and they are a natural predator. In one of our project sites, we've seen a lot of moon snails. They're a predator. Some smaller, you know, uh, you know, other predatory animals. Um, you know, farming is a tough business. You're at the whim of the weather and things like pests and, um, you know, diseases. And if you look at the investment that the the country has put into growing corn, um, you know, the aquaculture industry and and shellfish industry is like. It, it's still, I, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, but I think, you know, working in the hatchery and getting your little tiny baby seed, there's still a little like throw the salt over your shoulder and spin around three times to like hope it works. And um, that's because it's it's a relatively new, this iteration of the aquaculture industry in the U.S. is a relatively new one in comparison to agriculture writ large. So what's the biggest oyster restoration project that you've worked on in the world? Uh, in the world, I, you know, I, I haven't had, I haven't had a direct hand in the work, but in the Chesapeake Bay, um, a lot of investment has gone into oyster restoration in the Chesapeake in general. And they've set out some ambitious goals to really restore some of the tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay. And, you know, we're talking about several hundred acres of shellfish habitat that's been constructed that gets to sort of restored status. You know, the projects that we're working on here have basically been about an acre in size. Those are like demonstration in size. We're trying to like understand how to do it here, how to show people how to do it here, get through the, the system of how to make it happen. Whereas in say the Chesapeake where 
there are entire like industrial scale hatcheries that are dedicated to restoration and um, you know a whole infrastructure and industry around that. Um, we're a half step behind, maybe a full step behind. Just to follow up, so are they less municipal and things? Interest part is like a statewide thing, but they're interested. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of federal and state investments, so like the dollars are there, and that has been able to spur on some of the the bigger scale. This is more a question, I think, for the island creek growers. But when you have days where you might have like there's bacteria or warm weather days where you guys had shutdowns, do you have a sense of like how much that has impacted? Kind of your bottom line for business and being open and harvest. It's like a few times in a season or in a year. That's a lot. You, you don't get closed down that that often. Um, there are bacteria that can shut us down. Um, it's very complicated. Uh, but you know, ultimately, we grow a crop. So if we sell that crop over forty eight weeks in the year, we still sell that crop. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't as long as it's not protracted and um in some way disruptive in the market, um, you pretty much we, we sell all of this. Yeah. Um Steve, um what makes Duxbury Bay uh, a good environment for oyster farming? And what are some other promising areas uh, for the aquaculture in Massachusetts? First question. What makes Duxbury Bay good for growing oysters? It's funny, Duxbury Bay didn't have oysters until I started growing oysters. <laughs> so New York Bay, you know, here if there were oysters, you can actually find lot black oysters on the east side of the beach. Um, so you go back far enough, there were oysters in Duxbury Bay. The water's a little too cold for um, natural reserve, although with climate change, we're starting to see um, some wild oysters setting in the bay. Um, we do grow hard shell plants. We grow a lot of hard shell plants. So we're not really a monograph that much. We grow a lot of base golfs. We've done a base golf restoration program here. We grow surf plants. Actually, we're starting to grow some Sasha plants. I'll say just so. So there's you know, a myriad of, of different products that we can grow uh, to take some time in r and um, I'm really excited about surf plants. So the plant that grows out in the ocean, we're able to spot it in the hatchery and grow it up to about an inch, inch and a half. And we sell them at the Windsor House across the street most of the year right now. They're not on the menu. But that has great potential. We built a cannery in New Bedford recently. We canned those pre surf plants and they were, they were the, the hit. So there's all the other potential going forward. And that's just what we're doing here. What makes Duxbury unique? Um, we're an enclosed bay. So, you know, as opposed to going shellfish out in the ocean, we have some degree of protection. There's a big water exchange, about 70 or at least percent of the water goes in and out close to the bay. Um, there's, we're east facing, so we tend to get a lot of east winds in the early spring, which warms the water up. But conversely, in the summer, we get the kind of um, tropical wind, the southwest wind, which blows the surface water out and it keeps the temperature kind of in around the real point for us here in Duxbury. You see, you know, really, Cape Cod Bay is really the Napa Valley of the first of the Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, something interesting to say. Not everybody here. <laughs> did um, Sam, did you have anything you wanted to add on some of your program uh, stuff? Uh, well, what I can share a little bit of um, some pilot work we're doing in the north, the South Rivers. It's not oysters. Um, oysters are too sexy for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it is um, blue mussels. Um, and we actually chose blue mussels to look at, um, to enhance in the North and South rivers, in part because they weren't sexy like oysters, um, and that we could get more buy-in from our regulators uh, because people don't want to take blue mussels and eat them raw. Um, 
So there's less opportunity for somebody, the public health, to be harmed if somebody was to take blue muscles. And so um, this story actually starts a few years ago when we were um, looking at blue mussels uh, and maybe not farming so much, but gardening them, seeing if we could put them out on docks in the waters of the North and South Rivers as a way to uh, filter. Blue mussels, like oysters, are really good filter feeders, and they could take out pollutants, um, nitrogen, bacteria, and other things, and if we're not eating them, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so we looked into that, and um, we actually did a little bit of research and found that we don't have as many blue, like the oysters, we're not seeing as much blue mussels in the natural environment in our estuaries as we used to, um, at least not on the beds of the, on the bottoms, on the substrates of the rivers. Um, we do see them quite a bit on the undersides of of our human infrastructure docks and mm. moorings and other things. I'm a boat owner. I'm always scraping them with my, my, my boat. Um, but what we were finding was that, you know, a lot of those moorings come out, right? So the spat, which is the little young of year, are being taken out mm -hmm. and not growing up. Um, we did find some docks that are in year round, and we actually took uh, mussels from those docks that were sized bigger than an inch. Um, because at, after they get to a certain size, they're not as easily predated upon. And so we took them and put them behind um, here, actually. Put them here. We put some actually in front of the Nathotabong um, Sanctuary on the North River. And uh, the one of the sanctuary didn't do as well. This one is still growing. Um, and then a few years later, uh, we were approached by um, the Fourth Cliff um, Department of Defense uh, to work with Mass Audubon. Mass Audubon does, uh, the Department of Defense owns a recreation area out here for their, um, for the Air Force. So uh, some of our service men and women uh, are allowed to go out there and spend vacation time, which is really nice. Um, and uh, as it's a federally owned property and there are federally designated endangered species that utilize this in Third Cliff, they're um, piping clovers, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with those, <laughs> uh, red knots, um, there's another bird, a long migrating bird, um, terns, these terns, all of these species that are concerned federally. Uh, because it's owned by the feds, they have to be good stewards. And so they do a little bit more to try to provide support and habitat for these birds. And one of the things that red knots in particular, whose <laughs> populations have been declining, really like to eat are baby mussels. So um, we actually just started this summer with uh, some funding from DOD to examine where would be a good spot to maybe do some enhancement of mussel reefs, restoration within the area that these red knots hang out when they do their fly flyby, flyovers. And um, come to find out, we actually had a reef already forming right here. And they're small, they weren't very big, so it was new. And we were like, oh, well, great, we don't have to move any. <laughs> we could just study this one mm -hmm. and see how it's doing. Um, and it's about a about little more than half an acre. This is what it looks like. Um, yeah, kind of cool. The, this was at the end of the summer, into the fall. They were getting big. This is the their first year. But one of the things we also noticed when we were going out there, oh, here's the red knot. This is what, um, you know, the red knot bird that is the federally endangered species that is sort of the focus of why there's funding available. It's, I don't know its history. I'm not a birder, but it's it's like the longest migrating bird um, in the world, it goes from like the North Pole to the South Pole. <laughs> You're yeah, the bird or dog. Yeah. It goes from Tierra de Fuego, essentially, uh, all the way up to the Arctic. From Tierra de Fuego to the Arctic. The Atlantic flyway yeah. is so important. Yeah. For, for, for cool. Sort of like the horseshoe crabs and the, and the um, red knots as well. Red knots are also tightly synced together, so are blue mussels and, and this particular bird. So, yes. But what we found was that they were under heavy, heavy assault. <laughs> 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 and 
<laughs> and you can see by these guys, uh, the bells were out there. And it, it, it was actually a movie, but I couldn't figure out how to make it into a movie on the screen. But anyways, that guy's eating one of those poor muscles in there. And uh, there was just, every time we went there, it was a bonanza, <laughs> a, a fest going on. So, you know, that's something to be, as I think Steve mentioned, the world goes on around these things. And uh, while we want to enhance their populations, they may struggle. Go ahead. And this is another little friend of the, the oh, little muscle, the green crab. Yeah. And we know that the green crab in, is an invasive species mm -hmm. that, you know, it didn't really co-evolve with that. And so we had a, de you know, a loss of, of these blue um, muscles and maybe we can't, maybe we're struggling to get them back because when they're babies, they're just too yummy. And we've brought in some invasives that are now populating more, right? Mm -hmm. So, so further study to be done here. Uh, this is just the uh, first couple of years of us looking at it, but the idea would be to enhance these populations in the same way that they're enhancing oysters in other places. We sort of chose the blue mussel because we think we can get away with it <laughs> a little bit with DMF, which is the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, and we don't have some of the, the competing interest of trying to worry about the public health quite so much. Mm. Um, but further further study, we want to know before we start just doing things in the environment, what we're up against. Maybe this population will be enough that it can sustain itself and we can build on that. Um, that's what we're hoping, but we're going to keep monitoring this over the next year or two. So I think that's it for me. Any questions about blue mussels? <laughs> Did you see eye effects will be made in the wintertime on the mussels? Well, you know, it's, I, our, our uh, contract ended. <laughs> <laughs> We said, you know, we really should be monitoring this because, <laughs> hey, things don't go to sleep in the wintertime. We've got eider ducks, I'm sure. You know, these are just, a, these are very yummy <laughs> for these uh, animals. So I have no doubt. But the gulls and the, you got to think about numbers and scale, right? I'm, there's a lot of eiders out there, but they're nowhere near the number of green crabs and gulls, <laughs> right? So we may need to do some predator management. <laughs> That might be another way, rather than us just adding more young of year. Yeah. So the predator management uh, thing, we do have a green crab chikino dish at Windsor House right now. <laughs> <laughs> like that, like, right. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about green crabs in our lecture series before, and um, there's, um, I actually found in Jamaica Plain the other day, there's somebody who was selling dog treats out of green crabs. So those of you who live uh, on the rivers or in areas where green crabs are, maybe you can trap them and start to sell them to this lovely couple who I hope will do well <laughs> um, to sell the green crabs to them. Um, they're trying to find different ways to market them. And so I love it that you're making food with them and lots of chefs are throughout the... So ask for it at your next seafood restaurant, right? <laughs> yes, get so we we just took them from a site in the North and South River. So we're basically transplanting from under a dock that was a dock that was a, a fixed dock so that they had grown. It seems like the green crabs can't get them. Like, why are they on the moorings and underneath the docks, right? But they're not on the substrate. I think it's because the green crabs are, can't in, get up there. In the bay, they used to set on the old grass. So now the field grass is gone, maybe they're just setting on whatever is flowing. Yeah. yeah. It's a little, you know, there's so much, so yeah. many things moving and mm -hmm. changing out there that it's hard to always make cause and effect. But um, we did do a study in the river. We had a, a young woman who did a study in the river who lived on the river and she, um, we, we had green crabs um, coexisting with mussels and it was at the, about about the inch that they couldn't eat them anymore. Yeah, mm. so we put them in traps together, let them duke it out. <laughs> and then the green crabs eat each other. It's just mayhem. I think it tastes like chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about blue mussels that I can try to make a joke out of? <laughs> All right. Well, does anybody have any other questions? Is there anything that Skip would like to add? Skip, yeah. That, that, uh, it's so great to have you uh, in the audience and part of the 
It's great to have all you here. Yeah. This place. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for building such a great um, business right here in our South Shore. I think everybody's so proud to yeah. be part of, you know, eating and supporting you. So um, I hope people will join us. Um, this is kind of the conclusion of today, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You want to give a plug for the next one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. That was actually really great to add. Um, sure. And um, thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, our next lecture is next week, Wednesday, same time. It'll be virtual. Um, so those of you in virtual land, those 74 of you that are still hanging on, thanks so much. I hope <laughs> I hope it was a decent we experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so, but next week's is about wind farms. Uh, wind farms. Uh, it's on uh, January twenty fourth, and so what's going on with our coasts? Uh, we will be joined by um, someone from Massachusetts CCM, and then also Division of Fishery to uh, to talk about wind farms in the production off of our coast. A hot topic right now. So please join virtually. If you registered for this event online, you already have the link. It's the same link for each one. So, but if you haven't registered, please do, so you can get the updates about about it. Um, yeah. um, and so, other than that, mm -hmm. um, have your three oysters, or have somebody else's, because I know some people yeah. didn't want them. <laughs> so, the folks birding with us tomorrow morning. Yes. Yes. Oh, birding tomorrow morning. Yeah. That's right. And you Ryan, might see some items. Ryan and Beck, are we still good? We still have a couple leftovers. You do want us to yeah, we do. finish these up over okay. here? Okay, eat the way to speak. <laughs> the rest, the, you can go get them. Everybody yep. had their three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.